Um, well, it's good to uh, good to be there, and uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, um, but uh, it was great to hear Arvind, uh, who, by the way, happened to be uh, on my dissertation committee. So he's an old friend, and uh, uh, it was uh, wonderful to listen to him. Uh, what I wanted to do with you today is to sort of reflect on uh, an industry that I have been quite deeply engaged with, and that is the IT industry. I'm, I'm on uh, public company boards of uh, EXL. I've worked with, uh, you know, the various Indian majors, the HCLs, and we've worked over the years. Uh, so what I wanted to reflect on is the observation that, uh, you know, we've seen India inside. You know, we, we've done a great job as a country uh, developing services in the IT and business process management space, um, but we are woefully behind it as far as products are concerned. So I wanted to reflect on kind of India outside and how can we sort of make the shift uh, to the next level of value creation, and that is uh, the creation of technology products for global markets. So, so if you sort of start by looking at the statistics, they are actually very impressive. Uh, in terms of the IT services, clearly India is a world leader. We're touching almost $70 billion in exports uh, in 2012. And uh, India is almost 60% of the global sourcing market, uh, which makes it a leader by far. And um, even in terms of exports, uh, it's about 25% of the exports uh, consists of IT and BPM services, which has grown sixfold over the past six years. And more recently, we're seeing a lot of growth in business process management and uh, also in the analytics uh, space. In fact, at DXL Service, we are seeing growth in our uh, analytics and decision uh, uh, services. So as you look at the domain of uh, IT services, business process management, analytics, um, all of these IT-enabled services and knowledge uh, process outsourcing services, uh, India's done a fantastic job. However, let's uh, look at a different side of this picture. Products. Where are our products? You know, if you look at software product exports, uh, they are minuscule. I mean, they're, they're, they're almost just about a billion and a half, which is less than 5% of the Indian software industry. Uh, there's lots of small players. There's about 3,400 soft, small software product companies, but they're really very, very small. The average revenue is about a half a million dollars. And uh, sort of what's also interesting is that while services revenues have grown significantly, product exports really have not uh, grown. Uh, they've grown modestly at a 10% rate. And uh, while India is by far the leader in services, if you look at software products, we are way behind China, Israel, Russia, and Brazil uh, in terms of the software product revenues. So. Uh, and, I mean, more, more recently, there is actually an industry association that's been created around software products, and uh, uh, there is some momentum, but still, we lag way behind in terms of products. So the question, even if you look at the large IT companies, you know, the IT majors uh, who are now, you know, world contenders, multi-billion dollar corporations, um, they really haven't created, you know, I can't think of a product or a brand that really you know, from a software standpoint, stands out. I think perhaps the most famous ones we can think about are Finical from Infosys and the banking software from uh, Tata Consultancy Services. But uh, if you look at the size and scale of Infosys and DCS, relative to that, uh, these products are really, really small. And the, uh, we haven't seen, you know, the blockbuster products come out of even the large companies. And, uh, and actually, um, uh, that, that even what what is all, to me is even surprising is that these IT companies actually do outsource product development. In fact, I was speaking to one of the uh, executives at Wipro who talked to me about how in the medical devices space they're doing everything from the intellectual property search to you know to the IP creation to the product development to uh, to the design, and actually are turning over a finished medical device. Uh, and our finished product to their customers. So the only thing that is lacking is actually taking it to market themselves. So we are doing outsourced R&D, we are, are doing outsourced product development, but, uh, but we've not been able to, as Indian companies, develop our own products and our own, particularly our own branded products that are sold uh, globally. So, so that's kind of the problem. And uh, the question 
really is how can we proceed further in this journey? If you look at the IT industry journey, I tend to think of it as four Ps. You know, there's a, we started with people, right, which was really body shopping, and this was uh, accelerated by Y2K, but even before that, 30 years ago, we started with sending people uh, to the US. Then we started to say, instead of just giving you body, we'll manage projects for you. We'll manage you know, a particular application development project or a uh, maintenance project. From there, we proceeded to processes. We are now managing, whether it is IT processes or you know, business processes, uh, today, you know, Indian companies are able to manage the end-to-end -end process, whether it's the claims process or the customer care process, or it's the, you know, uh, you know. So, so, so we're, we're managing a lot of processes on behalf of the companies. But what we need to do is to move to the next level, which is really sort of now uh, creating products. Because of what is a product? Product is actually knowledge that's been captured and it can be dealing from people and uh, marketed worldwide as a brand. So the question that, that 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 one thinks about is so you know wh wh why should we care why should we why why am I making this uh, thesis that we really need to think in terms of uh, shifting towards products uh, the argument is kind of illustrated in this very simple chart that the problem with the services business is that it scales linearly with people you know in fact if you tell me what uh, an IT company's uh, size is. Uh, and, you know, uh, in terms of the number of employees, I can actually pretty much tell you what the revenues are because it's a multiple of, uh, you know, $30,000 to $40,000 to $50,000 per person. So if you want to go from $100 million to $200 million, you have to go from X to 2X number of people. If you have to grow your scale from 2 billion to 4 billion to, to you know, you have to double the number of people. Now, you know, that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing because it creates a lot of employment and clearly that's very important. But you can never scale a services business non-linearly. It will never look like a Google. It will never look like a Facebook. It will never look like a Microsoft. It's never going to look like, you know, the, the companies that we have seen that have really created literally hundreds of billions of dollars of value overnight, almost overnight. I mean, look at how quickly Facebook and Google have grown. That is because they have really been able to build products that generate revenues with a different business model. Their business model for products is license revenues, subscription revenues, where you're not having people generating revenues. So if we are to build the next Googles or the next Facebooks or the next Microsofts or the next Apples of the world, there is no way that services with a 40% gross margin and a linear scalability are going to get us there. Products have gross margins that can approach 85, 90, 92%. You know, Microsoft runs gross margins of 85%. Apple runs gross margins of 70%. So it's really products scale both in terms of the profitability and revenues, not linearly. So, and in fact, if you look at the top technology companies in the world, they're really not services companies. They're product companies that have famous brands. These are the IBM, Hewlett Packard, the you know the the the, the Adobe, the Microsoft, the Google, the Apple, the Samsungs of the world. So that's kind of the, the logic that I believe that if our industry is going to go to the next level, it's going to get to the next level in terms of creating market value and uh, global awareness of Indian technology, uh, we've got to move up as well. Now, uh, you know, let's look at another country that I have actually spent some time in and I, you know, I have uh, taught people there and that is Israel. And Israel is a very different kettle of fish. I mean, you know, if you think about what Israel has been able to accomplish, there's only 7 million people there, you know, and it's only been around 60 years, and they got no natural resources. But they, the number of publicly listed NASDAQ company out of Israel is greater than India and China put together. Uh, and this was all captured very nicely in a book called Startup Nation that talks about sort of Israel's kind of... Uh, uh, economic miracle and their sort of ability to build these startups. And these are just some examples of companies, product companies um, that you might have heard of, you know, Checkpoint Software, Viber, Vingard, Vocaltech, Nice Technology, Boxy, Waze, which was just sold to Google for $1.1 billion, Outbrain, Conquit, Gigia, PrimeSense. In fact, if you go, I was teaching in Israel a few months ago in Tel Aviv, 
you know, I had 60 students in the class and, you know, 30 of them were working on startup ideas. They came up to me later and say, I want you to advise my company. I'm, I mean, there's just a level of energy and enthusiasm there on startups around product startups uh, that is uh, really uh, energizing to see. So what, what has, what has, uh, what have Israel's success factors been? You know, because clearly, uh, you know, we have to look at the portability of these success factors. Several of these success factors are unique to Israel, but there may be some learning there for us. So why Israel has been so successful? In fact, I remember when uh, one of Israel's ex-prime ministers, uh, Begin, uh, said, we fight, therefore we are. You know, so they have a culture of fighting against adversity. Uh, in fact, there was a very interesting conversation I had with Yossi Vardi, who's one of the sort of, you know, he was the founder of uh, the early technology company, Mirabliss. And uh, he said the Chinese came to us and said, how do we replicate uh, what you guys do? You know, because the Chinese are always trying to reverse engineer uh, the success stories, uh, in, in whether it's India or in Israel. And uh, Yossi's response was, he says, you know what, just take uh, 3,000 years of persecution and, uh, and you'll be all set. So that's sort of, you know, that flippant, somewhat flippant comment. Actually, there's a truth in that, that people in Israel have this sort of mentality Really, they, they fight against adversity, they fight against the odds, and that's very much a guerrilla mentality, which is nothing but, you know, really entrepreneurial mentality. There's an entrepreneurial mindset in the country, you know, that the Yiddish word, Fuspa, really kind of you know, having the guts to go out and do something and uh, throwing caution to the wind. I also think it's really important that they have mandatory military service, because that gives them a sense of discipline and training, as well as every single Israeli has a certain level of understanding of technology that is mandatory. Um, they also use the military as leading edge customer. That's a lot of security software companies have come out of uh, Israel because the ITF is a leading edge customer that's pushing to deliver the latest, uh, latest, latest in terms, particularly in certain areas of defense technology. And uh, the Israeli government also does a phenomenal job of starting fund, startup funding assistance. You can actually apply for grants and pretty much provide all of this capital for you, the loan. Uh, and of course, there's a very strong connection between the United States and Israel. So those are some of the success factors. I think there are a few of them that we can emulate, such as the mindset and the culture. Others are, you know, wisdom. So, uh, so the question that I started to reflect on is why are we behind? You know, why have we not done so well in products. You know, what's missing? Because some of the ingredients, we've got smart people. We've got, you know, we've got potentially the cap. We've got actually successful, we've got no brand, branded companies. But, you know, to really reflect on it, they, that at the end of the day, even the Indian uh, major companies that were started off, you think about how, you know, uh, Infosys started off. And I was six people coming together and investing their own money very, they had very limited resources. So I believe that that created a culture of conservatism that said we grow organically and we grow and we are, you know, the distinction between the services business and the product business is that a product business requires massive investments up front and a very long gestation period before you start to see uh, the results. And that gestation period has to be typically funded through risk capital, venture capital, which was not available at the time in India. Services are very attractive from that end. Services put food on the table. Services make, you know, they're less risky. Revenues are predictable. It has annuity. And therefore, what I believe happened was that when you're operating at a very healthy gross margin, you brought 40% a year, you are 40, 50% gross margins. Why would you want to, you know, take a chance? Why would you want to take a risk? So it was a very, so in fact, I believe that the very success of the Indian IT major companies Kind of became a roadblock in terms of investing in products because there was really no need to. There was no compulsion. It was a risky business with a lot of invest. Uh, but in addition, I think that uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the infrastructure, particularly financial uh, infrastructure, services, infrastructure, startup, uh, even to this day, is not where it needs to be. It's not where it's, it's not Silicon Valley. It's not Tel Aviv. It's not. It's not uh, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, but beyond that, I think there is something else, and that is something that coming as a marketing person, you know, I, I, I study my PhD is marketing. I believe that Indian companies, technology companies, really need to up their game in terms of 
marketing capabilities, under that branding, marketing communication, distribution, you know, positioning. It's really kind of building world class brand, world class marketing. It's something we need to learn from the Intel's and Cisco's and the Microsoft's and Apple's of the world. So, so that's the bad news. That is good news. I mean, the, you know, several shifts are taking place in the technology world that are actually democratizing the world of uh, software and technology product development. Perhaps the most important one is cloud infrastructure. The fact that now you don't need to buy servers or infrastructure, you can get access to the same Amazon services that everyone in the United States has. So I think that the availability of world-class infrastructure for small startup company is very, very important as well. The other interesting uh, thing is the application for the app economy. You know, the idea that now you can actually build applications that can potentially become billion dollar company. If you look at Waze, if you look at Instagram. So you don't need to be a software company, something much more tactical. Plus I believe, and something I want to amplify on a little bit, our domestic market, look at Twitter, look at Instagram, look at you know, Facebook and so on. So, the, so my project idea is that you create a mass market consumer software company, acquire the first million customers in India, which are much cheaper to do, and by the way, there are many more customers in India. Then you leverage this learning and customer base, then reverse enter to the US market and trade the multiple, multiples for the US multiples. So that's the idea, and actually this is being done by a couple of companies that I want to tell you about. You know, take a company like Market Simplify. They have built a, a system for making trading, you know, for, which, which helps investors simplify how they deal with their, you know, uh, uh, their investments. They provide this as a service to investment houses. They first built their customer base in India, and now they are going to the fidelities of the world, the Schwabs of the world, in the US, and are being able to get, you know, a lot of success in the market with this initial traction. Another example is a company called Bimap, which is founded by one of my students. You know, and he started now. He's in India. He's actually in Gurgaon, right? You know, where you are. And, uh, and he has uh, built up a customer base in the Indian market in the area of career preparation and career management. And then he's going to leverage this to come back to the United States. So this is kind of an interesting reverse marketing phenomenon. So, so there are several arenas of opportunity, you know, particularly I think education and human capital because these are people intensive industries, financial services and healthcare, uh, you know, and full applications. So I think in all Mohan, of these you spaces, have one minute, please. opportunity for Indian software companies to use products. But what it's gonna take to win, what it's gonna take to win is the mindset that requires you to invest in products, think ahead to, to, to kind of have the the guts to say, actually go into this negative cash flow situation for a while, then come out of it. We also need to build up the market in the startup ecosystem, which we're doing, uh, and we need to enhance marketing capabilities. Uh, and this is something that I think particularly needs emphasis because we need to make the front end investment in building the brand and building your sales or an organization. But you know, we can do it. And, and I believe the future is really bright, but this is the shift we need to make from sort of made India call center to India outside. You know, the next Salesforce.com, the next Google, the next Facebook. Why can it not come from India when we live in such a democratized world of information technology? So that is the core thesis I want to share with you. Moving from India outside to India out, uh, so India inside to India outside, and evolving beyond IT service and outsourcing software product development. So I want to thank you for uh, your time, and uh, you know I wish I could be there in person, uh, but I hope that uh, we found some of these ideas provocative, and uh, we can stimulate kind of the next generation of where India needs to go in the technology.